This is Gareth Aiden, and I'm here for the Nashville Bar Association Oral History Project, and it's my privilege to be with Robert S. Brandt, who uh, for 20 years was a chancellor in part three of our chancery court. He's been a um, well-known and recognized community leader in Nashville for years. He's an author and an outdoorsman and um, conservationist and this is a real privilege, Bob, to be here with you for your oral history. Thank you. Uh, it's difficult to know where to start, so let's just sort of start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you were born, your family, and your childhood. I grew up in an unusual town, uh, a town built by the government during the Depression, a model town called Norris uh, in East Tennessee, built during the first uh, year of the Roosevelt administration. And um, uh, that's where I was born and raised. Uh, and um, I went to the same school for 13 years. We just had a school, and I went there and uh, left home to go to college, and that was it. Tell us about your parents, and uh, I think you have a sister also. I have one sister who's a retired uh, school teacher. Um, my mother and father met um, when my father uh, lived in Evanston, Illinois, near Northwestern University, where he went, and was a newspaper reporter. Uh, and my mother was a school teacher from Chattanooga who was teaching, taking summer courses at uh, Northwestern, and uh, that's how my parents met. And then, in order to court her, my father, uh, in 1936, moved to Tennessee and got a job with TVA and uh, uh, they moved to the town of Norris in 1939 and I was born in 1941. How large was Norris when you were, as you were growing up? 1,200 people. Wow. You, you mentioned your sister Lynn. Is she living here in Nashville? She does live in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you live here also, is I'm that a, correct? Lived in Nashville. I came to law school here and just never left. Tell us a little bit about your high school years, what you did, what you were interested in. Uh, I went to, the, again, I went to the same school for 13 years. I started kindergarten there and went there all the way through uh, high school. Um, the, um, I guess the thing that would distinguish my career as a high school student was the fact that I was undistinguished. <laughs> so I don't really have a whole lot to brag about from the, that era. While you were growing up, did you have any friends there in Norris who became attorneys also? Tons of them. Uh, I have no idea why, but a lot of uh, guys who grew up with me uh, became lawyers. As a matter of fact, almost all of my good friends became lawyers, and we didn't even have any lawyers in our town, so uh, I don't know how that happened, but it did. When did you develop your interest in the outdoors? And of course, this is really a large part of where we met and have become friends. Uh, Norris uh, was designed, this planned community in the Greenbelt or Garden City concept. Uh, and the uh, TVA, when they built the town, acquired 5,000 acres of forest land around it. And there were three camps of Civilian Conservation Corps workers there who uh, built trails all in that in that land and uh, that was basically my playground growing up. I mean we had full access to the woods and the lake and the river and the creeks and so that's just basically what we did as children. We played in the woods. Uh, uh, we did you know the sports and that sort of thing like like all kids do. Uh, uh, when you live in a little town like that it, it's fun trying to put together a baseball game with like four guys, you know, and we developed these little <laughs> games we would play, but uh, that's what we would do. And nobody had anything in those days. And, you know, I, uh, we had one guy had a ball, another guy had a bat. And, uh, you know, it's hard for young people today to realize, uh, you know, that how people just didn't have much in those days. And you could have a good time. That's even right. Even though you didn't have much. Right. What about... Uh, the period of time when you got to your 12th grade year and you began thinking about college, tell us 
where you went, and um, what you decided, and why. I uh, went to Center College in Kentucky, which is uh, a small school, smaller, much smaller then even than it is now. And uh, I was not a very distinguished high school student, and we didn't have much in the way of, well, we didn't have any college counseling at our high school. And so my father uh, thought that, and my father and mother thought that I needed to go to a small college where I could get some individual prodding or individual attention. And so my father actually visited the guidance counselor at the much larger Oak Ridge High School, which was in the same county, and uh, that guidance counselor suggested several small colleges, and center is where I ended up going, where your father was a professor at one time. Exactly. Danville, Kentucky. Yes. yes. And uh, did you enjoy center? Um, I didn't really like college all that much, frankly. Um, it was awfully small. It was only 550 students, and... Uh, uh, I sort of got there as a as somewhat of a, a shy boy from the country, and when you go to a small college like that, you're, you know, whoever you are when you start, that's who are, you are when you finish. And at a larger school, you can drift around and, you know, sort of find new f circles of friends and so things. And so by the time I my senior year rolled around, I I sort of fell out of place out of place there and. Was, Glad, glad to leave. But it was a great experience. I had a wonderful education there. Great, it's a great, like so many colleges like that. It's teaching is the focus, and the teachers were just superb. What was your course of study? I majored in history and had minors in English, economics, and uh, political science. And you graduated from Center in uh, approximately when? 1963. And. What did you decide to do at that point? Well, I had I had known for a long time that I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, and uh, so I, you know, I went through the process of applying to law schools. And, any, uh, any particular reason that you decided to go into law? <clears throat> Back in those days, um, I saw law as a as a as I, I've always been interested in public policy, and uh, and. And government. I grew up in a government town, um, and uh, uh, where everybody worked for the government or worked for a government contractor. And uh, I've always been in, interested in public policy. And I just it, it, that was during the uh, the Kennedy administration when there was a lot of emphasis on public service, and uh, and so I saw law as a way for me to. Uh, to further my interest in public public service, and my career sort of borne that out. It's been a, it's been a big part of it. How did you come to go to Vanderbilt Law School? Um, I came to Nashville for the first time in the summer after my freshman year in college uh, to work at a camp for handicapped children on Old Hickory Lake, and I uh, came back there for the next four summers. That's where you and I met. And uh, over time, I, I began to sort of sense that I, I felt more at home in Middle Tennessee than I did in East Tennessee, where I grew up. Uh, even though I love the outdoors there, I just I don't know, there's something about the culture of the of the Nashville area seemed to be more. I, I can't put my finger on it. And uh, uh, but the real reason is I had a girlfriend in Nashville, so <laughs> that's 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 why I decided to, to go to Vanderbilt. And that does make a big difference, yeah. I know. Um, how did you like Vanderbilt? How did that suit you as a law school? Uh, Vanderbilt is a is a fine law school. It's better now than it was when I went there. Uh, I did not particularly enjoy law school. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I is that uh, for financial reasons, I spent three years living in a freshman dorm as a dorm advisor, and so that that gave me seven straight years of living in college dorms, and uh, and I that was a uh, that was part of it. Um, uh, what about the people uh, you met? Who 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 b did you become good friends with during your law school years uh, that that we would know here in Nashville? Well, you know, interestingly enough, my law school class at Vanderbilt did not produce a lot of people who stayed in Nashville. So there aren't that many lawyers in Nashville who were classmates of mine. That's not true. The famous class of '57. 
But George uh, Crawford is one. Who uh, George was actually a year behind me in law okay. school. Although he's older than I am, he uh, he did something else before he went to law school. And uh, uh, but yeah, George is one. Uh, Frank Woods was a good friend of mine in law right. school. Uh, Lionel Barrett was. Uh, and then we had a, a large contingent of Memphis people when I was at Vanderbilt that, that, that were named the Memphis Block, even though a lot of them didn't know each other before they came to Vanderbilt. Everybody just called them the Memphis Block because Memphis people right. tended to hang, hang together, you know. So, and I have uh, kept up with two or three of my Memphis friends. Did you work while you were in law school? I did. I had the dorm job. And then they had, at that time, they had uh, a concessionaire who ran the laundry business and so each dorm had a laundry agent who took in the laundry and bundled it up and then the laundry would come by I guess once a week and pick it up and we got a commission so for two years I was the laundry agent in uh, McGill Hall so I did that and then I spent uh, a year and a half also uh, as a law clerk uh, for uh, for a law, law firm here in town so I had actually had three jobs when I was in law school who did you clerk for? I clerked for Bill Willis, who at that time was with a firm called Hooker, Hooker, and Willis. And um, um, back in those days, law clerks were, um, you know, you worked in the, uh, maybe a couple of hours a day in the afternoons after class, and uh, you, uh, you were a, a combination runner and, uh, and research is basically what you did. Right. And uh, you ran errands. You did all the filings at the courthouse. Sometimes uh, would, in the summer between my second and third year in law school, I worked for Bill full time. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit more expansive. And I would sometimes go interview witnesses. I would chauffeur him around, which was a real honor and treat to be able to to go to and from depositions with Bill or to and from court with him. And what learn a fantastic, from him. yeah, mentor. It's just unbelievable practice. experience for me. And changed my whole whole career, frankly. So Now, if, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, John J. Hooker Jr. was also one of the partners in that firm. Yeah, it was uh, Hooker, Hooker, and Willis, and the fourth lawyer in the firm was Al Knight. And Al became a distinguished um, uh, lawyer in constitutional law? Yeah, especially. he was a distinguished lawyer then, even though he wasn't that much older than me. Al, was a, Al and Bill both were wonderful teachers. I mean, they saw that, uh, and that's they saw that as their mission as lawyers is to help teach younger lawyers. And I have embodied that in my career. Uh, I'm meeting tomorrow with some law students to talk about some uh, arbitration competition that they're involved in. For example, I've taught part time at Vanderbilt Law School throughout most of my career. So uh, I really, I, they, they were such wonderful teachers to me, and uh, so I've been. That's instilled in me, uh, and uh, which is something I think our profession historically has been very good at. I agree. Let's go back for just a minute to law school. Uh, were there any professors at Vanderbilt Law School that really were were instrumental in shaping you or directing where your career went? Uh, I wouldn't put it that way. I certainly had some great teachers, uh, you know. Uh, I had a few teachers who were real giants in the profession, uh, the most prominent being John Wade, uh, who was also my first year writing advisor. So uh, just imagine coming to Vanderbilt Law School and having a world-renowned legal scholar like John Wade as my advisor. I mean, exactly. it's just, just a mind-boggling experience. Um, and then uh, back in those days, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, made a name for itself by hiring um, uh, retired professors from other law schools. And uh, one of the ones that the most famous one was Elliot Cheatham, uh, right. who wrote right. the brief in the great international shoe case. And I had conflicts of law from him. Uh, Blythe Stason had been the dean at the Michigan Law School. And I remember taking uh, administrative law from him and uh, so those those people were uh, you know real giants in the profession and Vanderbilt would would bring them in after they finished up somewhere else and uh, 
Uh, I had some wonderful teachers. Uh, Ted Smedley was a great teacher. Uh, Bob Covington, Jim Kirby. Oh, you're mentioning some names now mm -hmm. that I remember because yeah. I, I came through shortly, shortly after you did. Um, I think you graduated then from law school in about 1966. Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I want to talk for a minute about what I think of as one of the major aspects of your success in the community, and that is your your service. And, and as I recall, you were in the guard uh, as a part of your law school period. Uh, no, right I got after that. The, the back then we had the universal draft, except that if people married men uh, were exempted from it, women weren't involved in it, and. Uh, and I knew that my law school, that my career would would be preceded by some type of military service. I mean, that's just something we all lived with in those days. And so, a lot of people in my class, for example, were veterans. They'd already they'd already maybe had ROTC commissions in college and gone and done that. Some of them had had, done, had been enlisted men even right out of high school before they ever went to college. So, I'd say probably a good quarter of my class were already veterans. And so I just assumed that I would go and, uh, you know, into the service in some capacity or another. Uh, the JAG Corps of the different services came to Vanderbilt and recruited. Uh, you could you could fulfill your military obligation in certain civilian type capacities. So the one that, that I settled on was the FBI. And, um, and so, uh, but everything changed my last year in law school because that's when uh, President Johnson committed ground troops for the first time in a large scale in Vietnam and everything just went totally haywire and there was no it was just chaos as far as trying to plan a career my last year in law school and I've often said I spent more time in recruiting uh, offices than I did in class my last year in law school uh, the net result for me was that I joined the National Guard, which meant that I only had to do uh, four months of active duty and then six years in the, in the active reserves, unless the unit I was in got called up. And of course that, that did happen uh, in some instances, but uh, not to the extent that it does today in, in 2000 and during the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War. But uh, So I ended up joining the National Guard, which meant I only had to go away for four months on active duty. Were you in a JAG unit or? No, I was, a, How I, did that work? I was just a private in the National Guard. I was in something called the uh, 535th Administrative Company, which was the enlisted people all associated with the mm -hmm the Tennessee National Guard, Army National Guard headquarters. We call, they, their name was the Royal Lancers. It was, the, the emblem was a, a royal typewriter with two cross pencils on it. Uh, but uh, after I'd been out of law school uh, and about a year or so, uh, the Navy had a program where they were seeking to, um, because of the war, they had an increased demand f for lawyers, and so they decided that they would uh, recruit people to join the Navy Reserves as JAG officers. Uh, and to be eligible for it, you obviously had to be a lawyer, and you have had to have fulfilled your active duty military requirement. Uh, so uh, I ended up applying for that, and I don't want whatever I had to go through, I don't remember now. Uh, and so I became a, 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 an officer in the Navy Reserve JAG Corps. So I went overnight from being a private in the Army to being a, a what would be a captain in the Army, a uh, lieutenant in the Navy. And how long did your service in the Navy JAG last? Uh, I stayed in about 15 years. Wow. Bob, um, as I recall, you became interested in, in politics and public life early on. In your career, when did that begin? Sort of. Uh, well, again, I grew up around it with with uh, in, in the community we lived in, uh, and uh, I actually have a picture of myself uh, taken in 1956 
with uh, Adlai Stevenson when he was he was the Democratic nominee for president. Uh, he came to our town, believe it or not, because saving TVA from the Republicans was a big a big deal. So he was there with Estes Kefauver, who was a senator from Tennessee, who was his vice presidential nominee, and Governor Clement was there, and they had a big a big uh, rally at the at Norris Dam, which was the first TVA dam. Uh, to save TVA, and, and I had a sign that said to save TVA with Adelaide and got my picture in the Knoxville New Sentinel. And so that's the first thing I remember being involved in politics. And as I recall, you were involved in some way in John J. Hooker Jr.'s um, uh, campaigns for governorship at Tennessee. Yes, he, uh, well, I, the, 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 the one that really, I really got into in a big way was when I was in law school. I worked in the 1964 presidential campaign, and that's where I met Bill Willis. And mm -hmm. everything that has happened to me in my career uh, results from me working in that campaign in 1964. And um, uh, and then when I got out of law school, uh, you know, the, like I say, the employment situation was chaotic. I mean, it wasn't like today where you interviewed for jobs your last year in law school or your second year, whatever it is. I mean, you just... Even in the best of times in those days, you, a lot of people just got out of law school and started looking for a job. Uh, but with the war, it was even worse than that. I mean, there was no way to plan anything. And even people with ROTC commissions couldn't, couldn't plan what they were going to do. So uh, uh, at this, in the summer of 1966, after I graduated from law school, the partner in the firm that I worked for, John J. Hooker, Jr., ran for the Democratic nomination for governor. And uh, Bill Willis, who the lawyer who I really worked for, w handled the scheduling part of the campaign. And so I and another uh, young lawyer, uh, we worked for Bill and in, in, in that campaign full time, got paid, uh, and uh, took the bar exam during the campaign. I remember that. What did you do? I did the scheduling too. I, did, I scheduled surrogates uh, so that if there was a, I don't know, a, a weenie roast in Morristown, Tennessee, and, and they wanted the candidate to come and he couldn't come, my job was to find a surrogate to go and right. schedule that. Who was John J. Hooker Jr. running against? He ran against Buford Ellington, who had already served as governor once. And how did the campaign go? As I recall, Ellington won. Ellington won. Mm -hmm. And there, that was before there was any real statewide Republican Party to speak of in Tennessee. So the Democratic nominee was That's it. I don't even, if the, the Republicans Democrats. even put up a candidate, I don't remember who it was. Right. right. And that all changed four years later. When uh, Hooker, Hooker did win the Democratic nomination, and then he lost the, the general election to a previously unheard of, unknown dentist from Memphis named Winfield Dunn. And that was the 1970s? 70. And did you take part in that campaign? I worked in that campaign too, mm -hmm. but not, not full time. I was to practicing law by then. Right. And yeah. I might add, Governor Dunn was, a, was, I think, one of the finest governors we've had in my lifetime. There's a great story that I remember you're telling me, and I think, was Frank Woods also a person yes. who had worked in the law firm and, and helped in the campaign? Yes, Frank and I both worked at the law firm as law clerks, and he was more political than legal. And, and then he actually ran the Davidson County campaign for, in the 1970 race. My recollection is that after the two races and, the, and the after John J. Hooker Jr. failed to get the governorship, he did later uh, form many pearl, many pearl fried chicken. Is that right? No, I think he formed that between his first race and his second race. And by the time the second race came around, there was some bad publicity about the whole many pearl deal. And that his perception, I believe, was that that sunk his campaign. Well, that brings me to the wonderful story that you had told, and I want to ask you about it, about his offering stock. Yes. And Tell us about that. That's a great story. Uh, when he started that Vinnie Pearl thing, uh, people who were affiliated with, with him in some way or another could buy stock. And uh, I think the minimum investment was $5,000. And uh, 
and uh, I was in the army at the time, making ninety-five dollars a month, and I had no—I didn't have that kind of money, and so uh, I, I probably could have borrowed it, but uh, I elected not to. And a lot of people did well on that stock. They bought that stock privately, and then when they went public, they made. You know, somebody met at five thousand dollars made probably a million dollars. Yeah, but I, and passed, I, think I passed on that. Frank Woods, who was the other person clerking, decided to go out and he, borrow he did. as much money as he could. He did, and, and he did, did real well, well on that. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. Um, talking about your your involvement in um, in the public life of Nashville and the state, early after you graduated from law school. Did you actually run for a public position? I did in 1970, I believe it was, four years after I got out of law school, there was a limited constitutional convention. And uh, I always thought that I wanted to run for public office. So I decided I would run for the position of delegate. To that, and the the there were the the districts for the delegates were the same as the state house of representative districts. So there were 99 delegates, because there are 99 members of the Tennessee House. And so I ran for that, and I think I got 810 votes. Was that sufficient? It, it, it carried me over the top. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that convention and. What, uh, what's memorable about it from your point of view? The convention only dealt with one part of the Tennessee Constitution, and that had to do with taxes. And uh, the I didn't know this at the time, but the convention was pretty much run by the Tennessee Farm Bureau. And they, all but about 10 delegates who were elected were Farm Bureau people. And so when I got up there, I, I realized that I was just a, uh, just a, a, another guy there, and, and the Farm Bureau made all the decisions about what was going to happen. So, what, what was the outcome of the convention? Well, it was rewritten. The, the, the convention rewrote the, the provision of the state constitution, and that's the one that provides for assessments to be uh, percentages of the appraisals. Uh, on real estate. It, it wasn't the most interesting topic in the world, frankly. You know, um, a great deal of your At life... At least to me it wasn't. Right. And I, I realize for some people that may right. be the most important thing right. in the world. But, uh, by the way, during this period of time, did you get married? I did. Mm -hmm. And I know your bride, Anne, very yep. well. Tell us about where you met and uh, when you got married. Uh, well, I mentioned to you that uh, one of the reasons I came to Vanderbilt Law School was because of a girlfriend. That relationship didn't last. But while I was at Vanderbilt, uh, I met a girl who I was a law student and she was an undergraduate who I had, who was from Oak Ridge near where I grew up. And I had actually seen her once at the bus station in Oak Ridge. And, uh, and when I got to Van, when I was a second year law student at Vanderbilt, uh, I encountered her uh, at a social event and introduced myself to her and told her I knew she was from Oak Ridge because I'd seen her at the bus station and and uh, and I learned her name. And then uh, a few weeks later, uh, you mentioned Frank Woods. He and I were both dorm advisors. His girlfriend and now wife. Uh, it was a Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, and, and he, he, sa he said, why don't you let Jane Ann, his girlfriend, now wife, uh, fix you up with somebody, and we'll go, go do something. And I said, that'd be fine. So, he, he, so he's talking to her on the phone, and then he puts his hand over the receiver and says, do you know Ann Murray? I said, oh, yeah, I know her. She's from Oak Ridge. So that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and Ann has had a, a career... Uh, very distinguished in in law school admissions. And, yeah, she uh, she ended up uh, in a backhanded way going to work for Vanderbilt Law School. She was a journalist and and uh, she was Nashville's first TV newswoman actually. And uh, the first, the very first, yeah. And she uh, 
she ended up working at the law school and eventually became assistant dean in charge of admissions and was dean of students. And then following that, uh, I believe she's worked with the national organization. Yeah, the Law School Admission Council, which is the national organization of, for law school admissions. And she worked up there from uh, 1999 till uh, the end of 2012. And you and That's in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Exactly. And she has recently retired from that and is now back here in Nashville. You right. and Ann had a son, Marshall? We have one son, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob, tell me a, a little bit more about um, the work you did and, and how you came to be so involved in the out of doors and sort of how that started. I know you and I began backpacking 40 years ago or more. But, uh, well, I, I've, you know, the outdoors is just sort of part of who I am. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up in a, I mean, we lived outdoors when I was growing up. Yep. I mean, our house had 750 square feet. Uh, all the houses in our little town were, were little cottages. K kids weren't allowed to play indoors in those days. I mean, you just weren't. And, uh, and so we just lived outdoors. And uh, regardless of what the weather was, we just were outdoors all the time. And, uh, um, and you know, that's just sort of, ingrained in me and who I am and uh, and then at some point in my life I realized that if I enjoy the resource I ought to do what I can to help protect it so I became involved in in uh, conservation work first of all I think you've served um, as um, chairman of the Sierra Club Tennessee chapter. I'm part of a group of people who started the Tennessee chapter of the Sierra Club, right? And then I was the first chair chair of the chapter for two years when we started that in the early '70s. And uh, I believe that you've received a very prestigious award for your work there. Didn't you? uh, I did receive an award. The chapter every year gives an award uh, to a member and I did receive a, a award called the Sarah Hines Award which is named after a woman who was uh, a leader in the fight to save Overton Park in Memphis. As I recall you also served in, in a, an appointed capacity with the um, Conservation Commission. Yes, there is a an organization, it's a state organization, a government organization called the State Conservation Commission, and I served two or three years on that. But it doesn't really do much of anything, so. Have you, um, you know, one thing that I think about is the beautiful Greenway um, projects that we've had in Nashville and how, how much that served our community. You played a vital part in that. And, and you know, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about how you became involved in that and what you've done. Well, the, um, there are legal and practical reasons why judges shouldn't be involved in public controversy, personally, other than deciding cases. Right. And so during my 21 years as a judge, I was sort of disenfranchised, if you will, from from being involved in anything like that. Uh, and when I left the bench in 1997, the by that time, uh, Phil Bredesen, who was mayor of Nashville, was was starting the Greenways program here in Nashville, and uh, I was one of the people who he turned to to help help get that started, although I was not anything near a major player in it like other people were. There, there are other, plenty of other people who, uh, who really were indispensable to getting that going. Uh, but I had been involved in it. Did you play any part in mapping out where the greenways would be? Um, yes, I've had ideas that I've passed on. And uh, what's curious is that that there was a time back when I was a judge where I sort of conceived in my mind what a great network of greenways in Nashville would look like, and that's pretty much what we have right now. But I, I'm not a major player. I'm not. The, there are there are other people who I could name who are the ones who really made that happen. Another area that you've been very active in is the land trust of of Tennessee. Right. Tell us about what that does and what parts you've played in the land trust. 
Well, that again goes back to uh, Mayor and later Governor Bredesen. Um, a land trust is an organization that helps landowners save their own land. It's not a public advocacy group like the Sierra Club or uh, other organizations. And it, it works with landowners who want a mechanism to preserve their own land. And so that's what the land trust does. And I'm one of the founding board members of that. I've been on the board since, since Mayor Bredesen started it in 1999. And um, we, we, do, we do our work primarily through what are called conservation easements in which the landowner uh, puts an easement on their property that restricts what it uses and then they donate the easement to our organization and then our organization owns the easement and then it's the responsibility to enforce that easement in perpetuity for forever. The other thing we do, and, and we're doing more of this now, is involved in big, big projects, big public land projects that, um, where land becomes available and you have a landowner who, who wants to do something with the land uh, to save it and, and, and it, it might go into public ownership like a park or uh, in one case, the University of the South, it's not, that's not public, but it, public access to it is allowed. The conservation easements don't allow public access. It has nothing to do with, with public access. What are some of the projects that you're proudest of that have, have developed through the, um, through the land trust or, or in conjunction with land trust activities? Well, I'd have to say the thing that has really warms my heart is uh, you mentioned earlier that I like to write. Uh, one of the books that I've written was a travel book that came out in 1995 called Touring the Middle Tennessee Backroads, which 15 tours of Middle Tennessee. And, um, and then, then the land trust comes along and I get involved in that. And an enormous number of the projects that we have accomplished have been on those tours. Mm. So it was, it's just been a, a, a real thrill for me to have learned about areas, written about them, have other people read about them in my book, and then come along and be able to preserve them for all time. So that's, that's what I really feel strongest about. Well, that's one of the, that's one of the signal accomplishments of I think of your career, and you ser you've served on the board of directors of the land trust, and yeah. actually served as president. I no, vice president. Vice president. Never been president. There's another. Um, we have the way the land trust is set up is the president is a full time staff person, right? And the volunteers are like the board chairman, but I've never been board chairman. And you're still doing work with yes, the land trust. Yes, still am. Big part of my life. What about the? Um, Many people do know about this, but some don't. Tell us what the Maddox Charitable Trust is and the part you played in that. Well, uh, the Maddox Charitable Fund results from uh, the estate of uh, Dan and Margaret Maddox. Uh, they left their entire estate uh, to be a foundation, a charitable foundation, and as a result of some, some litigation, the matter wound up in court, and the, um, the trial court uh, appointed the board, the first board of trustees for that organization, and I was one of the first ones appointed. And so as we speak now in 2012, I'm in, I'm in my, I guess I'm in my, fourth or fifth year, I don't know, of being on that. And, and basically what we do is we, we make grants to charities. Uh, the charities apply to the foundation. It's not called a foundation anymore. It's called a charitable fund. It's a nonprofit corporation. And, uh, and then we review the grants applications and, uh, and then select the ones we want to make grants to and give away about two and a half million dollars a year.
The university school, I know that your son Marshall went there. But he I went there through the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, you've been involved um, very instrumentally with that school. Tell I was involved that. in the university school. I was on the board there, um, I think starting when he was probably in the first or second grade and all the way through almost till the time he left. Um, there was a vacancy, a, a board member uh, left town, and they called me and asked me if I'd be willing to fill, serve out the term, and I did. And ended up being on the board almost the whole time he was there and was was chairman of the board for two years. And during the period that you were involved, that school grew, I think, tremendously, didn't it? It did. And it's grown a lot since then. But I'm not involved with it anymore. Tell us a little bit about um, something that I know, because I know you well, and has been a big part of your life, and that is your work with the Episcopal Church. Well, I'm a lifelong Episcopalian, and uh, I, uh, my church is uh, Christ Church Cathedral in downtown Nashville, uh, and it's just a big part of my life. I'm, I wouldn't say my work with the Episcopal Church is not quite how I'd put it. I'm not really into church governance and church politics like you are, uh, but I do things at the church and through the church, which are an important part of my life, uh, not as much as I used to. You, I think, have been on the vestry at Christ Church Cathedral? Many, many years ago with your father, actually. Is that right? Bob, what about um, um, the Scenic Rivers Association? As I recall, you did some work with that group also. I was, in, I was a member of that years ago uh, before I became a judge, and um, uh, I was fortunate enough to receive an award from them for my work uh, uh, in the uh, Duck River preservation mm -hmm. effort. And of course there is the Mid-Cumberland Stream Fishermen's right. Association. It swings into action only on <laughs> select <laughs> occasions. Let's turn for a little while and let you tell, tell us about your law career. And I don't know quite how to begin, but I think you've already pointed out uh, that you um, graduated from uh, law school, I think, in 1966, and uh, um, just sort of take it from there. Well, I mentioned to you how chaotic it was at that time, and so uh, by the end of the summer, the governor's race was over. And I had passed the bar exam and remember thinking that I had gone from being an unemployed law school graduate to an unemployed lawyer. Uh, and my girlfriend was, had decided to go to Washington to work. And I had in my mind that I might like to do that too. I mentioned the public policy uh, right. that had always appealed to me. So one afternoon, uh, Bill Willis and I were walking, just taking a walk around downtown Nashville, and uh, we, he had connections with the uh, people in the Justice Department, and we were sort of brainstorming about, about what division of the Justice Department I might be interested in working in, and uh, who he knew there, and so forth. And um, uh, a man who I had not met before, Tom Shriver, who had just been elected district attorney, uh, came walking down the street in the opposite direction, and uh, Bill introduced me to him, and and uh, one of the things he Willis uh, asked Tom was, how you coming on picking your staff? And Tom said, well, I've got all the positions filled except one. I don't have a lot of money left, so I'm thinking about hiring somebody right out of law school. And that was it. <laughs> it's amazing how. So I did not go to Washington. Just a street-side, fortuitous yeah. meeting leads to a career. It is. So I did not go to Washington. And I began, I worked in the DA's office for four years. I was in private practice for six. And then I got appointed to the Chantry Court uh, at age 35 after I'd been practicing law 10 years, which is too young. I did it. <laughs> well, it was it was an outstanding 
run as chancellor. But before we get there, let's go back and talk a little bit about being in the district attorney's office uh, for the period of 1966 through 1970. What was it like? What were the things that you remember uh, and would want to tell people about? Well, it was a different era then. We only had uh, two divisions of the criminal court when I started. The third one was added while I was there. Uh, it was more cops and robbers than it is nowadays. Uh, I spent four years there and never was involved in a single case that involved drugs, and now most of them do. Um, uh, it was just a grind. You, 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 you just tried cases every day, day in and day out, and you'd sometimes prepare them 30 minutes before you'd start trial. Sometimes you had more, more time to prepare. I'd have to say a major turning point in my career was um, 1968, two police officers were murdered here in Nashville, and uh, it was a big case, and uh, it needed a lot of work. The police investigation was not very good. And so Tom Shriver basically put me in charge of putting that case together. And I spent I don't know, six months maybe working on that. That's not all I did, but that was a major part of what I did. And uh, that, that experience was, I'd have to say, somewhat of a turning point for me. I'd been practicing law less than two years. And uh, uh, and that even includes interruption for the military service. And I really learned how to prepare a case and I learned the I learned how important that is and how more often than not that determines the outcome of the case not the oratorical skills of the lawyer right right the work. and uh, the work and uh, so that was that was something that was very turned out to be very important to me the trial lasted a whole month and uh, so that was kind of a turning point for me, I'd have to say. You worked for Tom Shriver the whole I time? I did. Mm -hmm. What was he like to work for? Well, Tom was um, uh, a great person. I mean, he just was, I did, he was, I just, we all just loved him. Organization and management was not his strong suit, and that's one of the reasons sometimes we had to prepare cases 30 minutes before trial. But uh, he gave us a lot of autonomy. Uh, he was always there for us if we, if we needed him. And I, I just loved it. It was a great experience for me. Who else did you work with at the um, DA's office here in Davidson County that had an influence on your career? Well, back in those days, most of the assistant district attorneys were part-time. And uh, one of the people who was part-time who who had served under the previous district attorney who did not seek re-election uh, was Tom was John Hollins and uh, Hollins was the lead lead lawyer in the police murder case I was talking to you about so primarily as a result of that case I ended up in a very in a, a nice mentoring relationship with John and and I learned from him just how to how to try a lawsuit, how to get ready to try a lawsuit, and how to try a lawsuit. And he um, he went on to become one of the the preeminent uh, criminal defense lawyers in Nashville. Yes, I left I left the district attorney's office and went to practice with John when I left there in 1970. Back in those days, it was unheard of for people to make a career out of that. I mean, you just that's yeah. something young lawyers did and then moved on. Same with the U.S. attorney's office and. Um, and so um, I went and joined John's firm when I left the DA's office. But he, he was certainly an important person in my life. And what firm was that? The name of the firm then was Shulman, McCarley, Hollins, and Pride. And I think it's now called, I don't know, Shulman something. It's still around. Right. Nice right. people. Tell us who the who or were the name lawyers and sort of in that firm. Our Shulman, T. T. McCarley, John Hollins, and Lewis Pride. What type of work did you do there? I did uh, mostly insurance defense work. 
Was that your cup of tea? Some I did some criminal work, uh, court appointed in federal court mostly. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I liked it okay. It's, it, was, it was all right. It took me a while to get used to dealing with the insurance company bureaucracies. And I uh, learned from T.T. McCarley, who was a real expert at it, how you, how you do that. Now, this would be a period of roughly 1970 through 1973 that you worked yes. at the Shulman firm. Right. What did you do after that? Uh, I joined uh, George Barrett and Lionel Barrett, uh, no relation, in, in a firm we call Barrett, Brandon Barrett. And at that firm, uh, George uh, uh, was and still is a preeminent labor lawyer and had a lot of unions he represented. And you, when you represent a lot of unions, that sort of throws off a lot of non-labor non law business. Mm -hmm. And George needed somebody there to, just a, a regular lawyer who wasn't a labor lawyer who could handle uh, the business, that type of business. And that's what I did. What did Lionel do? Lionel, Lionel was Barrett. a criminal defense lawyer. That's all he okay. did. Okay. So you did some criminal work, but also a good deal of civil work? Mostly Lionel civil. Did. Some criminal, but most of that, again, was was court appointed in uh, in federal court. I never developed much of a real practice as a criminal defense lawyer. Was it during this period that you became involved in the environmental lawsuit involving the Duck River Dam? Yes, it was. Tell us about that because I think that also was an important early item in your career. The there was an organization called the Environmental Defense Fund that was backing a lawsuit try to prohibit TVA from building two unnecessary dams on the Duck River. And uh, they had a, their lead counsel was a lawyer from, uh, from Washington. And two months before the trial, he backed out. And I don't remember why, but uh, they looked around for, for someone to uh, take over the case and, uh, and try it. And so uh, they found their way to me, and I basically had to start all over again, put the whole case together in a period of two months. Mm. And I'll have to say, if the trial had started one day earlier, I would not have been ready. <laughs> what a project. That's the honest to goodness truth. I, the trial started on a Monday morning, and I was down at my office on Sunday afternoon working on it. What was the issue? The National Environmental Policy Act, which was new at that time, requires government agencies to consider the environmental impact of what they were doing. And the issue in the case was whether TVA had done that or not. And so uh, basically we they hadn't. I mean, they had they t the people at TVA had not only not considered it, they had fabricated a lot of information and data. And that was a shock to me. I grew up in a TVA town, with a TVA family, and it was a shock to me to see what TVA had become. You mentioned the, um, the, the, the learning experience. It's sad, I might add, too. Of really preparing for a trial and, and how details matter. Right. And I think that there were some interesting stories out of that preparation for you, weren't there, and what you found? Yeah, I found... Um, through just a lot of hard work. Uh, the TVA, uh, their environmental office was in Chattanooga and their lawyers were in Knoxville. And so uh, when it came time to, to uh, for the written discovery, the TVA lawyers just said, well, just go down and look at all of our files, go through our whole files. And so I went down to the office in Chattanooga and spent a day and I found all kinds of information that internal information for TVA where their experts people who were dedicated to what they were doing had said one thing and then it had showed up in the environmental impact statement it's just the opposite in some cases mm. uh, I found internal memos where people were complaining about that TVA people were complaining about the fact that uh, their work had been misrepresented and distorted and in some cases actually completely changed and uh, so that turned out to be a major point of the case. 
this was a um, this was a case that's somewhat legendary and similar to the to the, a lot of the litigation like the Teleco Dam litigation with TVA. Whose court was it in? Uh, Charlie Neese. What was he like? Uh, that's the only case I tried in front of him, and and he he had the reputation for being just uh, a real. Uh, Everything was by the book. Mm -hmm. He said you were going to start at 9 o'clock. You started at 9 o'clock. He said you were going to take a break at 9.45. You took a break at 9.45. Well, Judge Neese is the one that had the traffic light on his bench, isn't yes. it? And if, the, if yellow came on, you better get ready to be quiet. I actually scouted uh, Judge Neese like a, like a coach would. Uh, I uh, interviewed people who tried cases in front of him, and I'd heard a lot of horror stories about him, and... And uh, what I found out from lawyers who I respected who handled a lot of business in front of him, if you'll just learn what, his, what he requires uh, and do what he requires, you'll do fine and he'll treat you, treat you well. And so that's what I did. And I didn't care whether I liked what his rule was or not. If he said, you know, do it this way, that's the way I did it. How long did the trial last? One week. And how did it come out? A peculiar ending that, that uh, he found TVA had violated the law and he enjoined them from doing any more work on the dams. The Normandy Dam was already under construction. The Columbia Dam was just in the design or talking about phase. And uh, But then he did something kind of odd. He, he suspended the injunction so that it never took effect. So that eventually, TVA finished the Normandy Dam. They never finished the Columbia Dam. That's what I thought. Yeah, that one of them had gotten completed. Yeah, the but I mean, they were, they were money. They're money losers. TVA had to fabricate the economic benefits to try to justify them, and uh, and the only way they could do them was lumping the two together. The Columbia Dam was a was a, a real loser, uh, and 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 the TVA agricultural experts had had predicted huge. Uh, negative impacts on the, on the economy of Murray and Marshall and, and uh, uh, Bedford County, those counties down there as a result of this dam. Uh, did you get paid for your work? I did. Mm -hmm. I got, that was not a pro bono thing. Couldn't have been. It's too, yeah, too intense. Too, too intense. Mm -hmm. That brings us, I think, Bob, um, to the about 1976, and you've been practicing now for about 10 years. How did the issue of your becoming a judge come up? What happened? Uh, I just got a phone call one day uh, from somebody asked me if I'd be interested in uh, accepting an appointment to a newly created division of the Chancery Court. And I, Who were the two chancellors that were already uh, Ben sitting? Cantrell and Frank DeRota were already there. No, by that time, Alan High was there. All right. Take that back. He had placed, Frank had gone to the Court of Appeals, and Alan had replaced him. So it was Ben and Alan. Right. And Frank DeRota eventually went on to the Supreme uh, Court. Tennessee Supreme mm -hmm. Court. And uh, so I, I, cons I pondered it for a, a little bit and um, talked to my wife about it. And um, and I called the person back and said, yes, I would be interested. And that's basically all I said. And then eventually I was appointed by the governor. And that was before we had the process now where you go before a, where there's a, this uh, selection commission that makes recommendations to the governor. It was just a right. raw political deal. Right. Do you have any idea of who really promoted you for the position? Yes, I think Bill Willis did probably. Mm -hmm. Bill and his uh, his the people at his one of his main client, the Tennessee and newspaper, which would have been Eamon Evans, and John Sigenthaler. Right. And at that time, and I was uh, acquainted with the governor. I had, I did know him well, uh, but uh, I had worked in a in the campaign of one of the people he beat in the primary, Tom Wiseman, uh, who later went on to become a distinguished. Uh, federal district judge, and uh, after uh, Ray Blanton beat Tom Wiseman in the Democratic primary, Tom was very insistent that his people be loyal to the party and 
work in Blanton's campaign, even though there was, shall we say, not a lot of similarity between Tom Wiseman and Ray Blanton. Right. And, uh, uh, and so I did. I, I worked to some extent in Blanton's campaign, not much. So in 1976, you did receive an appointment to this new division of Chancery Court and served, golly, what was it, 20 years? 20 years. Tell us about beginning, I cannot imagine because I've never been a judge, what's it like to all of a sudden leave a law office, walk across to the courthouse and become a judge? Well, it's an interesting experience. I would have to say the first thing that happened to me was after I got sworn in, I went back to my law office and remember thinking when I was going back to my law office, I didn't feel any different than I did before I walked over to the courthouse to take the oath. It was kind of like when I got married. I remember thinking, I don't feel any different now than I did before I got married. Um, but um, uh, then when I actually got over there and started uh, presiding over cases, uh, a couple of interesting things happened. The first day, I I got I started noticing people were looking, staring at me, and I f was wondering if maybe my fly was unzipped or something or, or what what was, <laughs> and I I just thought why are these people looking at me, you know, and everybody in the courtroom was looking at me and and. Uh, and then I realized that's because I'm sitting up on the pedestal. I'm the judge, you know. And that was just sort of a, a jolt to me. And then the other thing that happened was uh, if, there was, if there was anything that discouraged me from accepting the appointment, it was the fact that I did not have any kind of background in, in corporate law. And uh, a lot of what the Chantry Court does are, is business, most of what they do is business disputes. Now that doesn't mean necessarily corporate, but, uh, but the, cor the corporate side of it, what we lawyers know is corporate law. The public calls corporate law something else, but what we know is corporate law uh, was really foreign to me. I'd never organized a corporation or, or done anything where I was just really a courtroom lawyer. And uh, I thought, you know, do, am I really up to this? Do I really have what it takes to provide over some of these complicated corporate cases? And the very first major trial I had, probably the first month I was there, was one of these incredibly convoluted securities cases that I didn't even, I didn't even know the terms that they were using uh, were, were new to me. And... Uh, one of the great lawyers in Nashville, who, who, uh, who this your firm is a successor to, Carmack Cochran, got up and made a 15-minute opening statement without a note, and laid that out in a way that even I understood it. <laughs> and mark of a real lawyer. Mark of a real lawyer, and uh, I just never, I never, I mean, I can, I can remember that like it happened yesterday, mm -hmm. and that was 1976. Uh, and I thought, you know, this man is really something. And he laid that right out, right, right out for me. <laughs> I think a lot of lawyers sometimes forget that one of their probably most endearing qualities can be simply that they might be good teachers to the court. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what he did. And, um, what and so that was, a, that was a, an early experience for me, and I thought, well, you know, I could do this particularly if I have good lawyers and, and uh, you know, who can, and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. That's another thing I learned. Right. Don't be afraid to ask right. questions. Um, what was it like to, to work um, with your two other chancellors, uh, Ben Cantrell and Alan High? Well, you just couldn't ask for better people. And then, and then Ben and I overlapped uh, maybe two or three years, and he went to Court of Appeals, and he was replaced by another wonderful man, Irvin Kilcrease. Yes. So uh, you just couldn't ask for anything better for colleagues. I mean, it was just uh, I was, it was an honor for me to be able to work with them and a treat to work with them every day. From the outside, uh, as a practicing attorney, uh, it always appeared that that, that that group of chancellors worked well together. We it did. Was very mm -hmm. collegial. Particularly Alan High and I, we. Uh, there was hardly a day that went by that we didn't collaborate with each other on something. We would seek each other's advice. We would share things. Alan was a wonderful storyteller. 
and he could he could come into your office and tell you some story about some seemingly boring trial and just make it funny and interesting. <laughs> Any cases you want to tell us about that you um, that you um, uh, presided over while you were chancellor? Well, there's several memorable ones. Probably the most memorable one, memorable one, was the one involving uh, Governor Blanton's pardons, uh, where uh, I ruled that he uh, there was an attempt to. In, the, the allegation was, and by that time it was not. It was not just an allegation; it was true that the pardoning process during his administration, and he's the one who appointed me to the bench, by the way, uh, had been corrupted. By uh, that time, people were, were indicted, had been indicted. And so uh, there was a suit to enjoin him from issuing pardons. Uh, and I ruled that, um, that, that the pardoning power in the state constitution is absolute. It's not subject to judicial review even if it's exercised corruptly, but that only the governor could could exercise it. And it had come out in the criminal investigation that he had just simply delegated the pardoning power to other people that, on his staff who were doing it. And a member of his staff was signing his name, the governor's name, with his power of attorney. And so I said those pardons were void because only the governor can do it. And that got the ball rolling that resulted in Governor Blanton being removed, leaving office early. And Governor Alexander sworn, in, sworn early. in early. Yes, I remember that. So that's kind of a, that's a, a major event in Tennessee political history, that whole episode. But I'm a footnote in it. My little decision is a footnote in it. Did you also have a reapportionment case? Yes, I had a major case involving the reapportionment of the legislature that involves the Tennessee Constitution's prohibition against splitting counties and legislative districts. And the reality is that you cannot, you cannot comply with the state constitution and also comply with the federal constitution's requirement for one person, one vote. So the Tennessee legislature had taken that, that, that inability to comply with both constitutions as an in, as an invitation to simply completely abandon the Tennessee constitutional requirement that uh, that you not divide counties. And this was having a profound negative effect on counties. Like some counties would be in four state senate districts. And so since the county governments are creatures of the state and so much of what the counties have to do is based on acts of the legislature relating to that county it became very difficult for people to govern their counties because they had so many different legislators to deal with. So they, f several county governments filed suit, the county executives filed suit uh, to, uh, to declare that the reapportioned legislature after the 1980 census, I believe it was, uh, was, uh, was violated the state constitution. And so I held that even though you can't, you do have to divide counties to some extent to comply with the one person, one vote requirement, you should only do it the minimum necessary to comply with that. And, uh, and that was upheld on appeal. And, uh, so that became the law in Tennessee. Right. So. And I understand today in 2012 it's still an issue. There's, a, there's, another, law, there are other, there's another lawsuit over the same thing. After 20 years of serving on the uh, bench, were there any practitioners that you know came before you that you just thought were outstanding as attorneys? Um, that, that you always, you, so lawyers you wanted to see. Oh come sure, your court? yeah. You, Anybody that you learn you how you learn as a judge. Uh, you know, the, to hear somebody say this who's not in the profession might not understand it, but. It's like any business or profession. You learn who you can rely on. And when lawyer A comes in and says, Judge, I need to put this case off uh, for some reason, uh, you know that every case lawyer A comes in and he has to have it put off for some reason. 
Uh, lawyer B, on the other hand, uh, you know, is somebody who, who tends to his or her business, and, and if they come in and ask to have it put off, they have a good reason for it. So you develop, frankly, you develop lawyers who, you have, credi who have credibility. And, and uh, uh, there was one lawyer here in town, he was a good lawyer, and uh, he's no longer living, but every case he had was the worst case of fraud he'd ever seen in his whole career. And, I got to where I chuckled after him. He was a good lawyer and did a good job, but it just, you know, every case was the worst case of fraud he'd ever seen. So, uh, so I learned not to pay too much attention to that. Uh, but, um, but certainly there were certain there were lawyers who were really, really outstanding, and and I, I would say that they're the ones who, who you know, help you when you have to make a decision as a judge. And of course, when I first started Chantry Court, jury trials were rare in Chantry Court. When I left, it, they were common. So. Uh, so a lot of what I observed from lawyers were, was, um, you know, how they did in front of juries, which I had begun my career at, as a jury trial lawyer. So I, I enjoyed watching that. Usually, sometimes I didn't. You had a reputation as being a rules judge. That is, you believed in enforcing the rules. Well, I couldn't figure out how you could how you can do it otherwise. I can't. I couldn't figure out how one can be fair and have different sets of rules for different people. And the rules of civil procedure are there and they're easy to understand and they're easy to follow. And it just seems to me that that's the only way I knew how to do it to be fair. And it, I was a little bit shocked when I would hear people say that. I mean, what's the alternative? And I really think lawyers want that. They don't want, if, you know, if, if there's a judge who, who bends the rules for his favorites. Today you may be the favorite, but tomorrow you're not going to be. So what most people want is just to be treated the way they're supposed to be treated. After 20 years of service as a judge, um, any major changes in practice that you noticed over the years? That well, we started mention? requirements that briefs had to be filed in non-jury cases. That was something we started. We started a requirement that lawyers exchange uh, exhibits before the trial. We used to have this practice where, you know, a lawyer would enter, hand a 20-page contract in, and another lawyer said, let me see it, and you'd sit there and wait for 20 minutes while the lawyer read it. So we implemented that, and that, that, I think that was Local Rule 22, and that turned out to be just something else for them to fight about because well, then I had a case once where a lawyer was objecting to something because the other lawyer hadn't provided it to him as required by that rule, and, and what the, the lawyer who was offering it, what it was, was something from the other lawyer's client's files. I mean, so it got to be kind of silly, you know. I mean, it was something he'd gotten from the other lawyer in discovery, so it kind of got to be silly. And, uh, but I, I was real, a real champion of improving the rules, of local rules, and in criminal cases as well, even though I wasn't a criminal court judge. I, as assistant DA, I saw how the system abused people. Uh, the, the courts operated very inefficiently, and uh, and people who were crime victims were were not only victim by crimes; they were victim by the court process. And so I advocated for some rules that were eventually adopted that tried to bring more certainty to the criminal court process, so that when when crime victims and witnesses showed up, uh, what they showed up for actually happened that day, and jurors as well. Right. When did you um, when did you make a decision to retire from the chancery court? Um, I became increasingly disillusioned with litigation, uh, which surprised me because I was sworn in as a lawyer on the morning of September 1, 1966, and I tried my first case on the afternoon of September 1, 1966. So my whole career had been in the courtroom, and I became disillusioned with lawsuits, particularly in the business context that I did in Chantry Court. And I saw that businesses would uh, spend a dollar to collect a dime or spend a dollar to keep from paying a dime. And so I got introduced into mediation, and uh, I went to a course at the National Judicial College uh, to teach judges 
how to be mediators and sort of became a born again mediator. And that was in 1996. And uh, as a result of my four years prior service as an assistant DA and as a result of the fact that I became a judge so young, I was eligible to take early retirement when I reached 55, which I did in 1966. And the very first day I was eligible to, I, I left and devoted, decided I was going to devote the rest of my career to helping business people resolve disputes in ways that made more sense than becoming adversaries. Not that that doesn't have a place in the process. I realize it does. But, uh, but in, in most instances, it, it's unnecessary to have these adversary proceedings. So I decided I wanted to do mediate business disputes, and that's basically what I did. Well, you were one of the groundbreakers, as I recall, for mediation in, in the in, Nashville. In Nashville, community. you're right. Uh, in 1966, uh, there there was there wasn't anybody doing it much, mm -hmm. and so my first task that I did, I, I spent a year as a senior judge and resigned that, uh, and then uh, and then when I, I went back into private practice, uh, I um, my first task was to go and promote the whole idea of mediation. And so um, the larger law firms, which tended to be the ones that came to Chancery Court a lot, uh, most of them have some sort of periodic meetings of their litigation people for education or whatever. And so I made the rounds of about 10 different law firms, including this one here, and uh, to pitch mediation. And not so much pitch myself, although obviously that's what I was trying to do. But, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, and, and I was amazed how hostile some people were to it. Uh, Who else was an early sort of leader in mediation? Well, Lou Connor okay. was one. Marietta Shipley, uh, although she was a judge at the time, she promoted it a lot. She was a leader in it. Um, Tracy Shaw came along. Tracy came along a little later. later. Yeah, because Tracy, I actually mediated some cases where Tracy was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And based on the way he handled himself and represented his clients in mediation, it doesn't surprise me that he's turned into a first class mediator. Mm -hmm. When I first started doing it, uh, I was like a country doctor. I just did whatever came in the door. And I did, um, I did. Um, uh, every type, every type of case, and then, but as more people got into it, uh, s more people got specialized, and so you know the the rear end collisions and slip and fall cases. Well, Steve Cox started getting all those because that's what he did and was good at, and uh, other people started doing different types of cases. So when it when I finished doing mediation uh, a couple of years ago, I I was doing pretty much exclusively commercial. Right. And the business, not pretty much, I was doing business business stuff. From the, golly, more than 10 years that you spent as sort of a groundbreaker and uh, leader of, in, the, in the mediation community locally, what are the keys to, to good mediation, to, to a good mediator's success? Well, from the mediator's standpoint, uh, paying attention, being observant, uh, being creative, uh, pers persevering, patience. Pe people who knew me as a judge and then mediated with me would tell me, you don't seem like the same person. <laughs> I can't believe you're so patient, you know. Yeah. But uh, those would be the things that, that I would I would say you have to be a good listener and you really have to pay attention to what's going on. You have to watch people and see how they're, watch the interaction between the lawyer and the client. And one of the things you need to figure out pretty soon is, you know, who's driving the car. Is it the lawyer or the client? Right. So you have to observe them interacting with each other. And, and what, what do you do when the lawyer's driving the vehicle and that's really not what you want to happen? I then start talking to the client, uh, and I would usually start off by asking them questions about things that didn't have to do with the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And 
you'd be amazed. I mentioned that book, Touring the Middle Tennessee Back Roads. Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed at how many people came in who, who were from areas that I knew something about because of working on that book. Uh, or people who read the book sitting out in the lobby of our law firm who would come in and say, well, I remember one woman came in and said, I was born in that house you wrote about. It. That happened twice, actually. Two times people came in and said, I was born in that house. So anything to break the ice. You know, my goal as a mediator is to, to gain credibility with the people. And so anything I can do to get to know them. And so you go around, go around the lawyers that way. I, I had a case once where... Um, a uh, very fine lawyer uh, represented a woman who was injured in a, in a, in a, with a truck on Interstate 40 uh, east of Lebanon. And he came in and, and he presented me with all this stuff about data, about jury verdicts again, on trucks and all this kind of stuff, you know. And so, uh, so we, when I got to be with him alone, I started talking to his client. You know, well, what is, you know, what is it you... What are you concerned about here? And you know, she didn't care anything about trends of jury verdicts. And and after talking to her, I found out that what she was really concerned with was that she would lose her job. She was disabled to some extent. She was an apartment complex manager, and she could no longer do some of the simple little maintenance things she did. Would have to hire a maintenance person. And her fear was that her apartment complex would be sold, and that a new management company would come in, and they wouldn't want her. So her big fear was that she wouldn't have health insurance. So we were able to work out a settlement that provided her with monthly income uh, until she reached age 65 and was eligible for Medicare. And so, but I never would have gotten to that if I hadn't personally started talking to her and developed that relationship with her. Wow. You know, I would be remiss if we uh, finished this interview without asking you a couple of other things. One is that uh, during these years that you've been a mediator and, and then later did an awful lot of arbitration work, you were with a law firm, am I right? Yes. Tell us about that. Um, I, when I left the bench, I, I decided that when I was, I decided that when I left the bench, I was not going to talk to any national law firms, national law firms, about joining them while I was still on the bench, still on the Chancery Court bench. Obviously, uh, right. I, I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. And so, uh, in the state courts in Tennessee, they have this position called senior judge, which is totally different than what federal people think of as a federal judge. We have this so.